So welcome back to the channel and today we are here with a special guest. So if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm um, Yol Lewis Edwards. I run High Fashion Talk and I'm a fashion photographer and videographer. So where can people find you, like social media and stuff like that? Uh, my Instagram is at Yolsi, I-O-L-S-I, um, or on Facebook, Yol Lewis Edwards. We'll probably put links in the yeah. description and shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's my, pretty much it. Yeah, so uh, like we were discussing earlier, people do like discussion videos on this channel. So I wanted to bring you on the channel and ask you the fiery questions that people want the answer to. So the first things first is like, why did you start High Fashion Talk? Um, I kind of started High Fashion Talk because I've always been in like these like Facebook groups for like different brands, like some Ron Talk and like, there's all been, been these groups, and like even sneaker groups right at the start. And so sort of mostly for buying and selling, um, but not really like discussing stuff. But you'd get like the odd like discussion post that was really interesting. Um, and I really like them. So yeah, and then like over the years, I was like in the basement and stuff, and that was a bit more discussion based yeah. and stuff. Um, and yeah, and then I, but I've always been into like high fashion since the start. Um, like, I don't know how I got into it, but I just remember seeing like, um, what's her name? Vivian Westwood dresses yeah. and shit. Um, <laughs> and it was, yeah, I just got into fashion from there and I always wanted to be able to talk to people about that kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, I started it because of that and I've kind of grown like a community around myself by like making friends with people in these different groups, group chats and stuff. So I knew that people wanted to do that and people, more people getting into high fashion at the time as well. Um, so it's just perfect time to do it really. Yeah. So why did you choose Facebook as a group? Because a lot of people are moving to Instagram, like people think yeah. Facebook is dead and people think yeah. Instagram is the place. Yeah, I think, yeah, literally everybody thinks Facebook is dead because like literally your aunt and your like grandmother's on yeah. there. <laughs> and it's like kind of embarrassing to be like posting shit and they're like commenting and like being like really cringe. <laughs> So like, I think, yeah, in that sense, like Facebook's dead, but like in a group, nobody's like seeing that except for people in the group. So yeah, it's private point. again, it's like your friends and like only cool people in groups basically. Um, so yeah, it's kind of dying like on your like normal feed, but groups are coming up again. Um, I think, yeah, there's no other platform that really lets you discuss stuff like backwards and forwards as much. It's like, Instagram is very kind of like, it's just an image and yeah. there's like maybe a caption, but it doesn't really get into discussion. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like YouTube even, it's like you get that whole like presenting information. There's not really that much discussion. Even yeah, that's like, true. You get some backwards and forwards in the comments, but it's not <laughs> like a proper discussion. So I've seen that High Fashion Talk now has kind of like an Instagram page and you're focusing more on the Instagram page. So what is the mm. transition like moving from Facebook to Instagram? Yeah, I don't really know what to do with the Instagram at the moment. It's kind of like, I want to do like fashion news or something, but there's not always like stuff that's really that interesting going on. There's like new campaigns and stuff. Um, but Instagram is such like a different platform. You yeah. have to grab people's attention. Yeah. Um, so I don't know really what to do. I've got the outfits page. It's just going pretty well. Um, but I don't know. I yeah. kind of find posting outfits all the time kind of boring. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I agree. Like, I don't like places that only post outfits. Like, Nah. It's just really easy to grow. Because yeah. everybody wants a feature. We'll shout you out and shit. So, yeah. I don't know. I think I'm trying to figure out the Instagram thing yeah. at the moment. Okay, so another question I have actually is, well, a lot of people viewing, some people think growing and, you know, running mm. a page is very easy. I don't know why people think that. Mm. So what would you say are the challenges, like day to day of running High Fashion Talk? Um, as a group, there's like so much that goes on. Like we have to, like as a mod team, like we have to, pretty much somebody has to read every comment that is said and that's like, 
I think we get like a thousand or over a thousand a day. And there's about 50 posts per day. So like, yeah, we have to approve all those, make sure they're all good. And that's like 50 posts that we actually approve. We yeah. like turn down actually quite a bit of posts just cause like we feel that some things might be better in other groups. Yeah. Um, they're not really relevant to what people want to discuss in high fashion talk. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's like, we have to approve all the members. We get over a hundred every day. Um, yeah, there's so much that goes on. And then like on top of all that, I've tried to like develop the group, make like events and opportunities and fun stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it takes a lot of time just to do all that. And then actually doing my own posts. I try to do like a few posts per yeah. day and I try to make them kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of different things going on. And then I've got my own like photography work on yeah. top of all that, which is, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, how do you handle stuff like hate you get, backlash, criticism, that sort of stuff? Um, probably I don't handle it very well, to be honest. <laughs> I'm really bad at taking like criticism. Um, so I'll get like angry at the time. Yeah. And I'll probably like say something nasty back, but I probably shouldn't be doing that. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, we, we all learn, we all learn. I'm yeah. it as well. But um, yeah, I try to like ignore it most of the time now. But yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard. You just kind of, yeah, people yeah. like find, if they like have like, something that they don't like or maybe they're like they don't like one thing and they don't want to say yeah. it or they just don't want like like that like you're getting the attention or whatever yeah they'll find something to criticize and there's always nobody's perfect yeah. there's always something to criticize it's just whether it's worth criticizing that thing and or, it's the way they criticize it as well yeah and they like use that one thing to discredit the <laughs> whole thing that you've done and it's like okay, that one small thing wasn't quite up to your standards. Yeah. But yeah, it's always the people that aren't actually doing stuff themselves that are generally- I have realized that. It's like anybody that's actually tried that kind of thing, they kind of like, you can take the criticism, yeah. the criticism better to start with because you know, it's coming from a place of like actually understanding what's going on and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people that have like, no experience doing these things and they won't even try themselves and they're ching on everybody else. Which yeah, is just from stuff. their couch, just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just how it goes these yeah. days on the internet. All right, so something that I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in is like, how do you make money as a group, like a fashion group on Facebook or mm. on Instagram and stuff like that? Um, like, at the moment, don't really focus on making money. Yeah. Um, we want to make sure that the group is good before we start making money off it and don't want to like have that as the reason for the group or like yeah. what's leading the decisions. Um, it is kind of annoying sometimes when people sort of jump onto the group and like don't engage with the group at all and then they're like promoting their t-shirt <laughs> brand or something. It's like, I work like, <laughs> 10 hours a day on this, not yeah. for you to get, sell like two t-shirts. Like, that's a bit annoying. So we try to just like, and I think also for user, like somebody in the group doesn't really want to be sold stuff they don't want all the time. Yeah. Even though that's a lot of like consumerism stuff. I think the hard sell is just a push off. So we yeah. don't want people to be put off by the group. So we don't try to like stop like a lot of it yeah um but yeah it's to make money like we're like working on some like bigger deals where it's more like special projects so we do like yeah. events or like some content um that people actually like rather than um just do basic stuff um but yeah we don't really make money at the moment yeah at all um, and it's all kind of funded by what money I make, but it's quite handy because it's kind of giving me, um, so yeah. people know me from high fashion talk. Yeah. So it's helping me to get work.
from stuff like that, from people that just yeah. know me from that. It's like a calling card. That's really good. So yeah, it's decent. Yeah. All right, so another big question, I know a lot of people want to know the answer to this is, so you're an established photographer mm. and creative in the industry, and I feel like it's really hard, even on this channel, a question I get all the time, how do you make it in the industry? How do I get connections? Yeah, so yeah. what are your tips, like as someone who didn't have any prior connections before yeah. coming into, that's another important thing. Yeah. Like how did you get your connections? Yeah, I mean, I didn't like, some people have those connections, they're kind of like, they'll go to school and yeah. like somewhere and they'll meet somebody or somebody's parent will be like yeah. somebody famous and that's like great for them. Yeah. But like, I, I didn't have any of that, like, I grew up in North Wales, yeah. and, like, lived there, moved to uni in Manchester, didn't really get to know anybody there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I did it mostly through like social media, um, just like friend requested people. Um, I even like went through magazines, like looked at people's work and like not just like looked for names, but like looked at <laughs> who I actually liked yeah. and then like actually look them up and kind of try to sort of learn something about them, get to know them. Um, and then like, just like try and engage with their content, comment on their posts, um, DM them, like don't DM them asking for something straight away. Yeah. Like always like lead with a compliment because, and like don't say I love your work, just say like what you like about yeah. it. And then if you're like genuine about it, it'll come through and people will like appreciate it. Yeah. And then some of the people I did that to, like they literally like are some of my good friends, like still to this yeah. day, like, and they were like in the industry years before me and I just respected them. Um, and yeah, I've got even like people that I've been talking to since like 2014 on Instagram. Yeah. Um, and I've never met, but we still talk on Instagram and stuff. It's really cool. Um, but yeah, like my story is like literally the thing is with like the fashion industry, yeah. you'll be doing like loads of like stuff and it feels like you're like hustling, like <laughs> grinding and like really going for it. And then like nothing much happens and yeah. then you'll get like this one big break yeah. and then something big, big happens. Um, so mine was like. Um, I was just like taking photos of people coming down to London like every now and again yeah. to like meet people and like just do photo shoots, nothing like big and never getting them anywhere. Yeah. Um, but I was posting on Instagram and like DMing people. And this one fashion week, um, I DMed like a bunch of photographers and asked if they wanted to go for coffee. Yeah. Um, and they like turned around and said, um, oh, do you want to shoot backstage? Um, and I was like, oh shit, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll shoot backstage at Fashion Week. Um, and yeah, I ended up doing that. Yeah. That was like a big break into fashion. Because um, it's like all who you know, they just have, yeah. to, it's like they have to know you, but also they have to know your work. But yeah, you just want more people to know your work. Yeah. Um, but it's really not about how many followers you have, it's the quality and the people you go after. Yeah making sure you get the right people. Really. Yeah. That's what people don't yeah. understand. Like people these days think like to be respected in fashion, it's like followers, but like in high fashion, you're not going to be respected by how many followers. No. This is genuinely how much work you do. It's just to get your foot in the door, mm -hmm. you need to have like the followers or people need to know who you are. But once you're in, mm -hmm. you can't be mediocre. You can't have mediocre no. work at all. No. And like, it's funny because some jobs really are determined by how many followers you have. Like, yeah they will like, it'll be somebody like Clueless that had, doesn't have any idea that will yeah. decide. <laughs> and it'll be like, oh, this guy has 60,000 followers, we'll get him, he's probably a better photographer yeah. just because he's more popular. Um, and that's like, that's just life, but it's kind of annoying. Um, but like yeah. most things, like anything worth getting, I think, is usually decided by somebody who has some like yeah. credibility and we'll kind of like decide on the quality of work. Yeah. Okay, so another really interesting topic I want to talk about because you kind of run a big fashion group mm. um, is why do you think brands these days don't understand social media like marketing? We were talking about this earlier where yeah. they think 
more followers equals more sales and my money, I'm gonna get my money's worth if I go for someone who has more followers. I think loads of people in charge just haven't grown up with social media. Yeah. There's like loads of people like who've got like five years in the industry or whatever, or yeah. 10, 20. Yeah. Um, and like they've learned the old way marketing, which is crazy. And like they don't get how like social media fits in. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe they'll do a course in it, which really doesn't <laughs> teach you much. I've like, gotten so many, like even on my internship, I was trying to like tell so I'm not putting anyone on blast, but on my internship, this person knows who they are. Um, the person who was head of social media had taken some courses, but she did not know yeah. what she was doing. I don't know what course, whoever like taught her that course needs to be sued because... Yeah, well that's the thing, there's so many people that don't know what it is and how to do it. There's like people that, they have not much more idea doing courses and selling them for thousands of pounds. Yeah. And just teaching like really basic stupid stuff that <laughs> doesn't work and then yeah it, it, it's yeah. like yeah it's just when things change so fast yeah it's impossible to actually yeah. keep up for a lot of people um but yeah it's <laughs> that's the way it is yeah okay let me just get into the nitty gritty of it because yeah i'm always that guy but um so basically what we were saying earlier we had this discussion and we were saying essentially that um a lot of companies don't understand that for you to be let's say into social media marketing in fashion specifically you have to know the industry you can't just have a degree somewhere or have this course for example someone like me i know if i had a brand um let's say someone like sanjeev even though he has less followers than let's say magnus you'd actually be better off paying sanjeev depending on what your brand was Whereas a different type of brand, Magnus might be better. Mm. Like it's not necessarily followers, it's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they don't understand it because they, they're not immersed into the culture. You have to be yeah. kind of part of it as well. Yeah, 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 as yeah. have the qualifications, have the knowledge. And that's where I think they get it wrong. And that's why I think mm. groups like High Fashion Talk can really in the future come in and be like consultants to yeah. these brands and, and tell them, them okay, the you want to spend this money, this is the right influencer mm. to go to. You don't just spend your money on the biggest influencer. And then complain that you didn't get your money's worth when yeah. the returns don't come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there's like some brands, like I think like Nike and stuff, are actually quite good at stuff like that. They kind of find people in that sort of culture and that yeah. field. they understand it's more than just a sort of market. It's more yeah. than that, um, which has always been a Nike thing that they understand like the culture around it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty cool that they're doing that but like more brands need to do it yeah and what i find really kind of like sad is that there's brands out there that like creatively or like yeah. design wise they're really like not that good but like they understand that they need to get like this person like this is the person they're going after yeah and they manage to sell like way more and like people just think it's a better brand <laughs> and it's crazy just because they have that like intelligence yeah. and marketing like yeah, a lot of fashion is about marketing now. Yeah. I guess it's always been that way, Yeah, to some extent. There's like, some people think about all oh, the good old days when it was about design. Never really been about like that. Like, lots of like Margiela was like marketing. Yeah, of course it was. And like, yeah, like Jean-Paul Gaultier was like shocking people. Yeah. That was marketing. Um, Alexander McQueen, like literally like Highland Ray, yeah. sending girls <laughs> down the catwalk looking as if they've been raped. Like, that's what gets you on the front yeah. page of newspapers. Yeah. And that's what launched these people's careers. Yeah. So I think discrediting people, saying that it's just marketing is one thing, but you have to consider their creative ability as yeah. well as their ability to work that yeah. marketing muscle. Because even in fashion, there's this notion where people say, oh, this person's going too commercial, this person, and it's like, no, they're just finding the best balance between mm. how can my brand actually stay afloat and be profitable, but at the same time be as experimental as I want to be, and you have to hit a balance. Like, I think the problem is, like, I've been telling brands, I've seen how these things work logistically, mm. so I know, like, as experimental as you want to be, there's only so much before you'll run bankrupt and then you can't make clothes anymore. Mm. And I feel like a lot of people that share that 
I only like it. Overly experimental stuff. They've never actually run a house yeah, and yeah, seen yeah. how that just does not work logistically. Like, you will go bankrupt. Yeah. So it's just, I don't know, it's an interesting topic. Yeah. There's like a psychology, like theories where yeah. um, with any like design or product or something, you have to be sort of, it's like most advanced, but still familiar. Yeah. So like you have to be like offering something new and exciting, different, but also you can't do that and it'd be something totally crazy that people don't understand. Yeah. You can't contextualize, which is really interesting because we talk about a lot of collections by like <laughs> the references they yeah. make where, oh, this looks like this and this combined, yeah. or this looks like this reference to the clothes from the 70s or yeah. whatever. Um, and it's interesting that that's actually part of psychology, not just some like fashion exercise. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like psychology, why people yeah. like stuff. All right, so we're actually in the book. <laughs> Alright, so what I want to talk about now is like the London fashion scene because mm. I feel like it's very undocumented. Like Paris is big, yes, we've got Dior and Louis Vuitton and mm. all those shows everyone talks about, like Comme des Garçons and stuff. Um, then we've got Milan, everyone talks about Sunne because mm. what they're doing with the text and all that yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. stuff, and obviously all the Italian brands, big Italian mm. brands. But the London fashion scene. I feel like it's most interesting because it's the most experimental first of all. Mm. Um, people take more risks, but it's just the least known. So like people don't know brands that I really love, like art school. Yeah. yeah or yeah. like Fashionist always has amazing designers and like people like Stefan Cook are really doing good work, but yeah. no one knows. It goes undocumented. Yeah. So why yeah. do you think that is? It's really interesting because like traditionally, like in the traditional press where you look at like the big magazines and stuff. Um, like London gets way more coverage, just the, at the start of the schedule yeah. as well, where more people are kind of up for it, and like nobody's tired by that point. Um, but also like, they because they are more creative and interesting and stuff, there's loads of shows that go on in Paris and Milan that yeah. actually don't get coverage at all. Yeah. Um, you won't hear, hear about it yeah. in the traditional press. Um, but I think there is a sort of the January fashion week to start with for men's. Yeah. Um, they do it so early, it's like literally straight after yeah. um, New Year's Eve. I think they, they're they talking about the men's one in January next year. Yeah. They're thinking 3rd of January. Well, that's a bit early. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I'll still be hungover from like New Year's <laughs> Eve. Like, I can't be doing that. Like, I'm only making it three days as well. So you yeah. can't like miss a day because you miss like a third of it. Um, so yeah, it's it's hard because I don't know why these these French, everybody wants to go to Paris though. That's the problem I don't know why it's only Paris. Like, there, it's almost like there's no fashion anywhere else. Mm. Yeah, I think it's just cause it's logistics more than anything. Everybody goes to Paris. So like, because everybody goes, all the shows go to yeah. Paris, which means more people go to Paris. <laughs> There's like this exponential effect of yeah. like going there and yeah, everybody kind of turns up. It's like a world fair or like a world cup basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, you get much more birds. Also Paris kind of like, because they're, they are the most powerful, they make sure that yeah. at the end of the schedule um, which means that, like, your articles, say you get an, a show review, yeah, it's only, like, live until so many other show reviews come after you. So, when you're in London, you've got, yeah. like, shows day after day after day yeah. after for, like, two weeks, and then you kind of, you get watered down, nobody yeah. catches up. At the end, like, Paris, there's, like, a few days, and you've got, like, nothing on. And then people have and time, people have to, time yeah. to take it in, and what will they take in? Those Paris things. Yeah. So there's just so many reasons for people to be in Paris, which also create reasons for people to be in Paris. Okay, that's a good point. It's just I don't know. It's really jarring that a lot of London fashion goes on there. of like really good mm. designers. Yeah. And I feel like just by virtue of being in Paris, by association, people see those brands. So like, mm. no shade, but like brands like Heron Preston. 
mm. is big because now the Home Passion Show is in Paris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like in London, there's just a lot better mm. on offer. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame really. Um, I think like London could do better to actually promote their designers as well. Yeah. Um, but I think it's just all part of this broken cycle of like the fashion weeks aren't really working for us anymore and they're not doing as well. Like for this brand I've been working with um, called Bertold, um, with, we're doing like Leanne Elliott is doing this new project with them where there's a core collection and they're just going to do like a different capsule every month instead of doing seasons. Right, so what did you think about Vazel Abloh's Louis Vuitton collection? Uh, I just think it was a bit boring this time to be honest. Like there wasn't anything except for those weird kite things. <laughs> um, those are like, I don't know. And like, I'm just bored of all this like copying or like whatever, yeah. like lifting references and stuff from other <laughs> places. It's just, I, I can't be asked talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I've just resigned to think like Louis Vuitton is just not for me. Yeah. Um, which is sad because it used to be a, like a house that I really liked, but I don't know. It's never been like that big a deal. It w wasn't really, like nobody really cared about it until yeah. the whole, um, the whole Supreme thing was yeah. around. Cause like before that they didn't like some collabs and stuff, but with like Chapman brothers, yeah. like only like highbrow art lovers would be like interested in that. Yeah. Um, and Kim Jones was doing good collections and stuff and he did like amazing scarves and um, he did that tattoo collection is really good. Um, but yeah, now I just don't connect with anything Virgil Abloh does, so I'm not gonna like <laughs> expect to or like criticize him on not being able to do that because he's probably connecting to loads of other people. Yeah. It's a good uh, politically <laughs> correct way to put it. <laughs> that's cool, that's cool. What um, did you think of it? Uh, LV, yeah, it's just copied some of the designs, <laughs> others, he, he was inspired, others, uh, it's a bit of a mess. Mm. I, at this point, because I don't want to sound like someone who just hates, like, on Reza, because people are probably tired of me, like, saying negative stuff like that, so I really try to stay away from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, at all, at all costs. Yeah, there's <laughs> just no point, like, trying anymore. Yeah. It's just, yeah, I just know, man. It's just, even when Kim Jones was at LV, mm. there was just no hype. Like, no one, it's almost like people only care about Louis Vuitton because of Virgil Abloh, not because of the clothing itself. Mm. Whereas back then, it was like, if you're really interested in Louis Vuitton, you would know what Kim Jones was doing, otherwise, you wouldn't. Whereas now, LV is just kind of like a whole celebrity media frenzy. It's not even about the clothing anymore, no. it's just about the. I don't know, the austerity behind it and like all the celebrities or who's going to the LV show, I don't know. Mm. All of it is just a bit jarring to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's also like, Louis Vuitton is like the biggest brand, mm. I'd say like financially, like as a yeah. powerhouse, it's like Alvin and Mitch's baby. Mm. And it's just become kind of like a commercial mess, mm. almost. Yeah. I think people sometimes like forget that it's always been their like cash cow. It's yeah. always like the bags, especially on the women's side. It was like the bags yeah. that sold. They did slightly different bags every season. Yeah, and that's what made the money. Um, it was never really. Mac Jacobs was amazing, yeah. um, and did like amazing collections for the women's wear. Um, but it was always the bags that people cared yeah. about and stuff. And there was nothing. Mark, even though he was really good, he never did anything that was like... I'm trying to think, like the elevator yeah. collection was really good, but there was nothing revolutionary about it because everybody expected it to be yeah. big. And it was a spectacle that was basically to frame the bag and tell it yeah. every time. Um, so when people say, oh, it's ruined, like it wasn't, there wasn't much to ruin in there. Yeah. <laughs> It's only 10 years old as well. I don't yeah. know if people, like, the red to wear was only done in 2009. Yeah. Is it 2009? 
Uh, no, I no, can't no. Remember, actually. It was in 1999. It's, it's not that old anyway. Yeah, but um, yeah, actually, I don't want to talk too long, otherwise, this video is going to drag on. But the yeah. last thing I want to talk about is did you see the Versace um, Spring Summer 20 collection? Um, Please tell me you saw that. Remind me of what it looked like. Okay, so basically, it was a direct copy of everything Martine Rose has ever done. It was like a Martine Rose compilation. I can't remember. Like, if someone was to make a best of Martine Rose collection mm -hmm. and make a collection, that was Versace. Oh, really? Spring Summer 20. The reason why I brought it up is actually yeah. because, so I always say that, like, she originated this kind of like streetwear oversized aesthetic that all the streetwear kids have stolen. Mm. And people are like, how did she make that? How is she? Who copies that? And then another thing I say is, that sometimes even Demna has kind of taken inspiration from her. And people are like, how can Demna take inspiration from her when she works with Beyonce mm. And it's like, no, but that's why Demna hired her. Mm. Because when you're taking stuff from someone and you don't really know how to do it properly, you're going to hire the person that knows how to do it properly, you bring them into your team, mm. and now you really have what you're going to do well. And with brands like Versace, this was a pure example of how our London scene doesn't get well documented. Mm. And then Martin Rose does what she's doing, and then you have Versace, they cut it, sell mm. all the pieces, and people like Martin don't sell the same thing. Because mm. people who are none the wiser think Versace yeah, 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 are yeah. people that originated. So what do you think about that? Do you think people are allowed to be inspired by stuff, or is there kind of like a line where it's just like, mm. that's going a bit too far? I think that is something interesting to be said here, because somewhere along the lines, we've kind of lost trends. Um, it used to be like the trends and then every designer would be ending up doing their version of that trend. Um, we generally don't get that anymore. We've got designers doing pretty much variations on the same thing every season. Yeah. And if somebody does something similar to somebody else, it's copying them rather than maybe hopping on a trend is a bit mm. negative, but like doing that trend, yeah. which was like what fashion was for decades. Yeah. Um, so it's like, it's an iffy thing. Like how can you claim a feature to be your your own? Yeah. Because like all oversized has been around for years and years. Yeah. Like maybe you, maybe it is bad that we're like, claiming ownership and it's part mm. of this kind of call out culture mm. and this kind of um, telling people what they can and can't do, same as like cultural appropriation. Yeah. I think there is a point where people are a bit too close to the bone and do it wrong and like there's a lot of example where um, cultural appropriation is wrong. Yeah. Um, but. I'm not sure if we are maybe too sensitive to some of these yeah. stuff and it might be having a negative effect on fashion in general. Yeah, I feel like Diet Prada is the main proponent of why that happens, but I think even, yeah. so let me say Demna for example, I think Demna takes a lot of inspiration from Margiela for example, mm. a lot of his collections, so many influences from Margiela, it's endless, mm. but I don't think he's copying Margiela though. No. So you can see the references, but I wouldn't say it's quite mm. because he's kind of, you can see his own touch and his own twist on it. Whereas with the Versace and the Martin Rose thing, mm. everything down to silhouettes, even the colors used, even the styling was the same. Like mm. surely if you're gonna like get inspired, at least change the styling of it, the styling mm. was the same. It's just like, at some point you just have to be like, surely you could have just, take more time and come up with something a bit more unique. It's kind of, that's where a lot of people get frustrated with Virgil because Virgil doesn't take an idea and kind of add his twist on it. He takes it mm. and makes a carbon copy. And where they write maybe their brand, he'll just write off white instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where it gets really bad. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and he's been seen to do a lot of that. And I think he thinks, or like he's, He's talking about some way he's doing it, like, and that's an artistic statement in itself. Um, but I don't know which artistic statements we do allow in fashion, which we don't. Yeah. This. Yeah. It's a bit of a slippery slope, hundred percent. Yeah. 
Mm. It's, it's a hard one. Yeah. But anyway, so we don't let this video drag on too long. Uh, we'll have to end it here. But um, yeah, definitely follow you on Instagram if you want to say yeah. what your Instagram is again. Um, yeah, it's Yolsi, I-O-L-S-I. Yeah, and uh, definitely follow me on Instagram at Fashion Roadman if you didn't know already. But um, yeah, thank you for watching. And on that note, I'll be back with another video soon. Thumbnail gas. <laughs> 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 Ha 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 ha!